take a brief introduction. My name is Michelle Bryan and I'm a Quality Health, Safety and Environment Specialist with iTrack 365. Now, when we talk about risk management, we can consider risk management in many business units of your organization, such as quality, health, safety, environment, and also using this powerful tool to make decisions on items that might be subjective. So I like to use the famous iceberg model. I'm myself a health and safety professional, and I always think about when we look at the iceberg, we tend to look at what's above the water and ignore what's underneath. So I just wanted to bring this up as an analogy is that when we have our consequences, those are the things that we can see and we're dealing with, but our unexpected consequences those are things that we can really use a risk assessment tool to determine what is going to be a high risk, medium risk, and low risk, and then determine how we are going to mitigate or control the hazards or the production loss, etc. Now, we always try to think about due diligence, and I think using risk matrices and risk assessments is a very powerful tool to determine what is due diligence and have you done and done everything that's reasonably practical to make sure that we're doing the best we can and making sure that everybody goes home at the end of the day. Now I just wanted to bring up the iceberg once more where I feel like the stuff that's outside or the tip of the iceberg you're being reactive where you're looking at the bottom of the iceberg where you're trying to be proactive. And I think that's where things come into when you're trying to do continuous improvement of your management systems. Then we're going to look at where we have taken a deeper dive into your management systems where you're taking into account your plan, do, act, check. Now, where do we fail? Where do we fail to plan and develop? Do we fail to implement in the field? Um, I find that most organizations do a really good job of planning, developing, but we sometimes fall short in the implementation process where we have good intentions, but we just can't actually execute and follow through enough to get to the acting where we're actually checking to see if what we said we were going to do, if we're doing it and if it's effective. Now, when we talk about a risk assessment, it's a very common practice to use this in the safety and in the ISO quality management systems. Um, I'm going to just go through some of the risk assessments here. So when we have our risk assessment, what we're trying to do is bring all the hazards onto the same playing field so we can kind of do a comparative analysis on what is going to be ranked low, medium, high, and then you're going to decide, okay, what are some controls that we can put in place? What's practical? What are we actually going to do? Um, I find it very common that we're doing hazard assessments and we have these controls that we put in, but we actually don't do it. Like in the field, we're not executing those controls. So it's actually an inflated hazard assessment where we're looking at our actual risk, the potential risk, and then the residual risk. At the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're doing those hazard assessments with true actual practices that actually happen out in the field. And then again, we can use this to prioritize our policy updates. Um, we also do this risk-based decision making. You can use this in any field and it really makes a good tool for making decisions. You're, you don't know how you're gonna tackle something. I'm like, well, let's make a risk matrix and let's change the axis around and see what's gonna work. And then in that scenario, I use that to prioritize how we're gonna proceed with our continuous improvement or if we're developing a new management system, I'm gonna focus on the high priority items and then work down to the low priority items. So, some of you guys may have seen this before, others have not. Um, so 
I, we have a picture here and we want to look at what the hazards are. So I'm going to give you guys a moment uh, to talk amongst yourselves to determine what the main hazard is going to be here. So I'm assuming everybody is going to talk about the elephant in the room, or in this case, the shark. Um, it's a very common, common answer to choose the shark. But when we look at this here, uh, sharks kill five people annually. This is just some random stats off of the, the internet here. So if you look here, we've got cows kill 22 people annually, ants 30, horses 20, hippopotamuses 2,900 people. Who knew? Jellyfish kill, kill 40 people annually, and then we have a deer. So I guess the one thing that we're going to think about is we're looking at that shark, and we kind of didn't even see the jellyfish that was there. But the main hazard in that picture is not the shark, it's, it's not the jellyfish, it's actually the water. And I think we take, we get too complacent with the things we're so used to. So I feel like in that we're so worried about the shark, sometimes we forget about the water, where the water is actually a higher risk. So if we were going to look at this risk matrix here, and we're going to look at, let's do the risk matrix on the shark. So we know that it's a very rare occurrence that a shark is going to, in this scenario, I, we're from Canada, we're uh, not surrounded by any water, so it's actually the potential for getting eaten by a shark is zero, but just for explanation and analogy purposes, we'll continue on here. So in this scenario, we're going to have a, a, a rare and, and the, the outcome's probably going to be fatal. So you can see down here in the corner that we're going to be a medium risk. Now, if we look at the jellyfish, I would say that it's a little bit, it's unlikely, but it could still happen. So again, the jellyfish is going to be high. Now, when we look at the water, um, I could say it, it's expected to occur at some time or may occur at some time. But regardless of that, we're still at the very high aspect here. So in this scenario here, I think like if you look at workplace safety, a lot of times we're focusing on we in in our perception or in our mind we're thinking that they're very high but in actuality they it might be medium so let's take for example i like to use knife use um i'm a farm girl i grew up on a farm um, i'm surprised i have all my appendages still um and we use knife use all the time and i've worked up in um big projects up north where we weren't actually allowed to use knives because there were such a high incidence of people cutting themselves because we take for granted knife use. We don't cut away from ourselves. I think everybody listening on the call can probably attest that they have cut their finger um, one time or another in their lifetime. So in that scenario, we're going to talk about here where um, it's almost certain that at some time somebody will cut their, head, their hand, um, although it's not going to result in a fatality or an injury. Um, but most of the time when you do cut yourself, you probably are going to require uh, some stitches. So you're going to have to go to the hospital. So in this scenario, we're at very high. Now, if we look at another scenario um, in the workplace, such as, um, let's just say something that we're worried about, getting eaten by a bear out in the out in the workplace where we're working remote. Now we've we we could see them. Um, it's probably likely that's going to happen. Um, we might have an encounter. So I'm going to say, okay, it's you could probably result in an injury or illness, but the chances of it occurring is probably medium. But I, but I think we think about our risk matrices. We have to think about actually what the risk is of things and then use that to educate our workers that um, we're not going to get struck by lightning or we're not going to get eaten by a shark or we're not going to get eaten by a bear. Although the, the outcome could be fatal, the likelihood of it is not. And I think we need to make decisions as an organization to worry about the things that could happen or that happen frequently. Like if we look at hand injuries, 
Hand injuries are often one of our most prevalent cases, but it's like we're so complacent with using hand tools or using snipes or using pry bars that we're when it when an incident happens, we're like, oh well, I've used this all the time, um, and it could be a severe incident where uh, other other things that we we do lots of safety around where we're focusing on things that are non-routine tasks where routine tasks so again i encourage everyone to look at their tasks that they're doing look at the incidents they're having and work back and do a risk matrix on it and then start developing your campaign so in in conclusion here is your organization busy focusing on the sharks and forgetting about the water, which could actually be your real risk in your organization. So what we're gonna do is do a demonstration of the risk management processes that are in iTrack and also look at some of the options that are available. So right now we are doing a field level hazard assessment. So on this one here, you can ask for directions on how to fill out your hazard assessment and then it also gives a really great video on hazard management. So the whole point of doing hazard management is to try and identify the risks and then what we want to do is either mitigate the risk, eliminate the risk, substitute the risk, and try to get it down to as low as reasonably practical. So we do have a couple of options when it comes to doing hazard assessments or risk management assessments. So what we're going to do here so we can pick our task and we're going to have this task here. And so for this control here, we are going to be able to do a relationship where the hazards are pre-populated to this task. Now we're going to check the potential risk. So in this scenario, we can say that it's a 13 and then we can also um, put the controls in here for say there's a standard operating procedure as well as let's do um, some fall protection which is not in here and our controls will show up then we also have other plans to eliminate the controls if they're not in the list. We also can put who is responsible for the control. And then we can say once those controls are put in place, we want to reduce the risk. So perhaps it's a, a five. So I'm just going to go back up here. So we have 13. And so we always want to reduce the risk. So we reduce the risk from 13 to five. So this here is a standard risk matrix. It's a four by four matrix. A lot of companies have a five by five and some of them have a six by five to account for um, a near miss within their incident matrix because when you have a near miss, the actual risk is actually zero, but it's hard to pick that in here when there isn't a zero category. So on this one here, we can save and close. We can also add another hazard. So you can see here, we've got the potential risk and the mitigated risk. So basically right here, you're making your hazard assessment. And here's another example. So you can have these pre-populated. And here we'll go here. And these ones here are actually controls. Here we go. Pinch points, muscle strains, slip strips and falls, falling objects, flying objects. Okay. So this one here is a one to many where you can select many hazards. And then what we're going to do is we're also going to select many controls. So in this scenario, we can collect that one. I 
etc. Save and close. And so here's our potential risk. So we can do the same thing where it was 13. And then we can also do the mitigated risk that is now a 10. Or a 5, whatever you determine it's going to be. So that's one way that you can use the eye track for your risk management processes. Now we're going to go into a different form. OK, so we're going to look how we can use risk and eye track to assess our incidents. It's a very common practice to risk rank all your incidents. And in this scenario, um, there's lots of things you can do with a workflow when it becomes to risk. So when we go down to our risk section, so our actual risk is what actually happened. And so for this example, let's just say there was some equipment damage that was less than $10,000. And for this one, um, we've had this incident happen before. So we're going to take and look at what our actual risk is. So this is uh, medium. Now we can also look at the potential risk, um, say that it could be more damage, um, but maybe it's reasonably probable on this one. And so now it becomes a high risk. So as a, an organization, you can decide um, when you're doing your risk ranking, are you making decisions off the actual risk or the potential risk? So if this was human injury, I think um, if you have an actual risk that's low, but the potential risk is high, that's a good time to go in and review our policies and procedures and propose a safety campaign of some kind to try and prevent that incident from happening in the future. Now, a cool feature of iTrack is lots of managers have lots of incidents. Um, they're busy, they're not, safety isn't their only priority. It's a high priority, but there's also operational priorities that need to be addressed. So when you look at the hierarchy of your company, you can maybe look at this and say, OK, um, when you look at the impacts of it and the risk, when you have a medium risk, maybe it's going to only go to the supervisor review and it doesn't need to be escalated to upper management. However, say this, this is a higher risk perhaps because of the risk of this one, it needs to get escalated to the management. So when you have an actual risk that's this high, perhaps that you could send an email notification to the executive team when something happens, or you can add an additional status in here that upper management needs to review it. Um, sometimes when you have upper management or senior management review every incident, often it's difficult to get them to review stuff because they're so busy, then the incident stays in a status and it actually doesn't close out. So these are just some tips and tricks that we've learned with managing electronic processes when it comes to incidents. So it is a cool process where you're going to be using risk to manage your work processes. Um, lots of our clients do that and it's quite effective that if it's a low risk, um, you could basically not even investigate it if you don't. So determining why you're going to investigate it, if you're going to do a full investigation or just do some corrective actions on it, you can really start streamlining your processes to making sure that you're bringing value um, and not having the full blown investigation for every single incident that happens. Um, because we at the end of the day, we want to be providing value and making sure that it doesn't happen again, but we don't need to do a full fledged investigation on on a broken tail light that costs $30. So that's just um, depend. And of course, that all depends on your guys's management practices on that item. Well, thanks, Michelle. My name is Qasim Al Rafi. I am the customer support representative as well as the Power BI specialist here for the iTrack 365 team. Um, I have in front of me the 
Power BI out of box that is available to um, every iTrack customer. And one of the individual reports is this pre-risk matrix. Now, as Michelle mentioned, there's pre-risks, actual risk, as well as mitigated risk. We can customize three separate reports for all of them, but for today's example, we will be using pre-risk. Just a couple things to note. On the top, we have a created on date slicer, so you're able to see, you know, um, when the incident was created on, you can start filtering it to see how you're doing over a set period of time. And we have pre-risk level category. Is it a low risk, a high risk, or a medium risk? So if I click low, you know, the green ones are filtered in and the orange and red become blank. Medium, orange gets filled in and high, red gets filled in. You have the ability to filter, you know, through the impact of the risk uh, of the incident. You know whether it was negligible, marginable, critical, and if your if your risk matrix is five by five, five by six, six by four, um, we have the ability to customize this risk matrix to whatever your company uses. And finally, you have the ability to slice by probability, probability, whether it's probable or improbable. Um, it will filter the visuals as well. So as we're going through it, we do want to see what this you know the highest risk is and we want to link that to the um, to the portal to get some more information on it. So what we would do there is we can filter by catastrophic as well as probable. And we see here at the bottom, it was an injury hazard. Obviously this is a test environment so the data might not make any sense. You know, this is the employee who reported it. This is when it was reported on. Here's the description. And this little URL link at the bottom will link you to um the iTrack portal here where you are able to actually get a bit more information of what exactly happened. So that's a quick rundown of how Power BI can be linked to the iTrack portal for your reporting needs. So just a quick thing on risk matrixes and um, iTrack has some really, really great options on using risk matrixes and making risk-based decisions. So I encourage you guys to talk to our sales team um, and go from there. And thanks for listening. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you want to learn more, please visit us at www.useitrack.com. You can also email us at sales at neosystems.com. You can also follow us on LinkedIn or our YouTube page for more videos. Thank you.